you so much. Um, thank you for the good evening, good afternoon. I don't know if I can um, First of all, um, we are sorry that we don't speak Slovak, so we will have to speak English, and English is also not our language, so please excuse our mistakes. And uh, first of all, also, we wanted to thank you, Judith and uh, Petra, and also Christiane, who curated the exhibition Queer Stories in Transit. And, uh, well, we aim to start, we, we like to start with this quote from Carla Lonzi's Let's Eat on Hegel's, uh, which is a book, Carla Lonzi's a very now well-known uh, Italian theoretician uh, from the 70s. She wrote this book, Let's Spit on Hegel, uh, in 1975. And um, there is a, a sentence that we selected from her book that is really important for us because she mentioned, she described some um, what we would call unexpected subject. In Spanish, we say sujetos imprevistos. This idea of an unexpected subject who is, who is a subject that society is not really controlling or expecting or knowing how he or she is going to behave and who under or counteracts the dialectics, the dialectics of slave and an owner of the slave um, would be a subject which in the 90s when we read Carla Lonzi there were many of her um, affirmations and theories that we would not agree completely but this idea of unexpected subjects was very important for us. She was a, a little bit uh, lesbophobic so that's the reason why we, we feel like it a little bit apart of Lonsi's point of view, but on the other side, they are trying to make this radical feminism um, like a orchid dream in the middle of Italy. So, so that was the point that we, we want to to take of her. Um, normally, when you are using theories, theoricians, theoricians to to talk about your work, sometimes you choose some men who are also misogynist or lesbophobic, so why not to take a woman who is like that in a way? And this is also why when we use her quotes, there are some, there's only one sentence that is highlighted and other sentences that we would not use so much. This idea of unexpected subject uh, has been um, like navigating different works of ours uh, in, in different years, and like we, we use this this flag that was we will see later, no? used in uh, in some videos that we were shooting, and also navigating our work because we ourselves felt like unexpected subjects in many ways, especially in the art scene in Spain in the nineties. Two women working in collaboration. Working in collaboration was at the beginning for us something quite unimportant. We thought it was not, apart from questioning the authorship, the individual authorship, which was an issue for us, but we didn't think that the structures were not ready at all to receive to artists who worked in collaboration. So there were many difficulties for us, apart from the lesbians at the moment, we would go to the like a back class because in the 70s it was it was quite usual that people worked together in teams at least in Spain there are famous teams working together but in the 90s they want to recover the genius figure and everything was uh, built for individuals and it, you can even apply for grants it's like that so this this uh, video some of the works we did in the beginning and mid mid 90s had also to do with this idea. This is called boyos. Boyos is a word, is an insult that we use in Spanish to call lesbians. So, but it means uh, cake. So we thought, well, cakes are nice. 
and they taste good. So why don't we eat a pollo in front of the camera? In a way, all our work from the beginning of the 90s was very auto-representational and also like a statement. We needed to say, okay, everything we are talking about is something we feel part of. It's not something that we look from the outside, it's something that we are inside too. We are part of it. So eating in front of the camera, eating a cake in front of the camera was like saying, okay, you call me Goyo, so what? <laughs> in a way, it's also a very cared for performance in formal aspects. We, all our video performance in the 90s have to do with this, using the limits of the representation space and not the center of the image, like escaping this idea of occupying the center. What happened there in the 90s, I mean, could you imagine that uh, Judy Butler was translated to the Spanish in 2001? So obviously nobody knows Butler. But also in the, in the art world, they don't want to talk about identities at all. So we were there, but we are talking to uh, people from the north, uh, people from Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, so we were like in, a, in the middle of nowhere. So you have some lectures and some influence that nobody else uh, shared with you because they didn't know it. And also they refused to, to introduce identities in the art world. The, the, the critic and the theories were pretty formalistic. So these um, works from the 90s, as I said, was also, were also very influenced by theory, like Butler's idea of taking an insult and using it to be proud of it somehow. Uh, that was a clear strategy, yeah. even though, I mean, before, that, before Butler, I mean, we, we, yeah. we always say we never study the queer theory, we live queer lives, which is different. <laughs> Later, you study theory, but at the beginning, uh, in the, at the beginning of the 90s, we were building the queer uh, world and the queer revolution. So, just go down. Well, there was a, a part we are like doing a little bit of uh, going through our, our works during the, the 90s because it's maybe the work that most people don't know. Even in Spain, actually, when we did these uh, shows about a uh, kind of retrospective, many people were like, where were you? How, how is it possible that you were doing all this work during the 90s? And many people, even in Spain, don't really know where were this, this work. After doing all this auto-representative work, in which works in which we were present all the time and presenting ourselves in front of the cameras, we were thinking that there was a kind of expectation from the art world that a queer world or would be like bodies, 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 and cultural representation. So we wanted to escape from that. And we started to work around spaces and the fact is important to know, I mean, everybody wants representations of the otherness. We want to see the other, that's, that's what people say, so we decided not to do it. Uh, it's just a question of, of it's a confrontation when it's this kind of unexpected subject. We decided always not to do what people expect us to do. So we decided to talk about the spaces, the spaces the, the bodies inhabit in a way. I mean, not, when you are talking about queer issues, nobody uh, expects you to stay you know, in, a, in a parliament, for example, in those years. There was no gay people or lesbian people in parliaments talking to the West, or things like that. So they expect you to, to live in, in people in spaces like this context, like, like spaces, like opener spaces with swimming pools or things like that. The, the use of swimming pools, it's because uh, we want to quote some kind of artists who came from, from the gay uh, art world, like David Hockney, for example. And also because in Spain, swimming pools are in the What spaces do queer bodies inhabit? 
Um, and we thought, that we don't want to find a specific place, but we would imagine queer bodies inhabiting spaces that are out of, like dislocated somehow, out of place and time. Looking at swimming pools when they are empty for us was like looking at a place at the wrong time, at the wrong moment, like using parentheses. The, the space between parentheses as a space that you would inhabit, that we would live in, like looking. This is just the moment when you don't have to look at this. This is just the moment you don't have to take a photograph. This is just the place that would mean, in David Copley's point of view, happiness and joy and so on. It also, this also has to do with a um, uh, trip and a stay that we did in San Francisco. We got a, to a scholarship to go to, to study in San Francisco. We could have chosen going somewhere else, but we chose San Francisco because we had this stupid idea that San Francisco would offer like a utopian place for us. And we dreamed of this uh, we dreamed of this ideal place that when we arrived was completely different. Um, suppose we, we live, uh, live, live in a very conservative country and there is a paradise over there in an Anglo-Saxon country like the United States that where we can live a better life. So we decided to test it. <laughs> and we find the, the San Francisco post-AIDS era with so many people died and also a space uh, where women have no power at all, uh, at all. lesbians live in a poor space um, districts, um, so not too healthy. And, I mean, imagine that we, we, when we were there, there, there was there weren't even a, there was only one women coffee shop, and there wasn't any uh, bar or place to meet lesbians, for example. So we realized that. In Madrid, we have a lot of them, so <laughs> we realize that the paradise is not as it seems. But also, uh, we are not used to that. Uh, what we learned in the States is that there are, they like to divide people in, in, and put you a labels who makes you to have a, a, a narrow identities. In a way, it's good because you are, uh, if you don't exist, nobody can talk to you. I mean, if you don't say I'm a lesbian, nobody can realize that lesbian exists. But on the other hand, it puts you in a very narrow uh, space for living and for having experiences. So in this uh, ambivalence, we want to, to move back to time. This is an installation that we did um, appropriating a part of uh, uh, one of, the, of David Hockney's uh, paintings, some others. And we installed the photographs in, in these uh, environments. We also took these uh, pictures of um, gay and lesbian discotheques in Madrid um, just at the end of the party. The feeling that we had was like being always at the end of the party when everybody turned the lights on and then you realize where you are. And the place looks completely different. And there are also the, all the rests and the, the <laughs> what people have been using, what people have been doing, all the, the everything that has been happening is somehow there. Um, in casting, yeah, we changed. The, this is the work that we started to change because we felt a little bit tired of working with ourselves or, or working alone, isolated. So we, we try to find more people that that be kind of complicity with the work. So we started to open the, and change completely the methodology. For us, the methodology is uh, really important. We when we work, when we work as a, Queer artists, for example, we decided to use queer strategies, which not mean only to look at queer individuals, but also to change the way you approach your works, twisting them, making them queer, or uh, inspecting the moment, uh, talking, uh, putting the people in uncomfortable situations, things like that. That's what we what we call the queer strategies. Yes, it's what we call queer strategies. 
we don't really know <laughs> if it's something that you, it's like fear is something that you can somehow reinvent it's all the time. What you can construct, what you can think. This is a way of working that doesn't really have to do with other ways of working. Uh, it's true that we were tired of seeing ourselves all the time and also being alone, working like together. So we, with casting games in, uh, we, we did an open call. This is not, uh, this was uh, 2004 and we still didn't use Facebook or the internet so much. So when we did an open call, we are talking about going to the streets and putting posters all over and asking for people who would want to collaborate in an art project. Um, we wanted like women who wanted to play um, a man in a video artwork. And talking about queer methodologies or about how we, we like to work, an important part of how we like to work has to do with communicating with the people uh, who are participating in the work. First of all, you, working with people who are not professionals, really uh, amateurs or just people who have never had anything to do with acting. Even though when we did this open call, many uh, art students or drama students came to the street call and also explaining to everyone what's the context of our work. Actually sometimes when we explain people, you know, we are queer artists, everybody knows about it, this is our work, it's quite um, clear or explicit about its meanings and many people say okay I don't want to play a role. So for us it's important that people who want to collaborate they know where they are collaborating, they also have to know uh, that an artwork can be seen maybe 10, 20 years later at their hometown, which is something that some people also yeah. have seen. <laughs> or at least where we're going. I still think that today, even though everybody says, oh, this is, you know, old town and so on, you can still find a lot of persons yeah. who are very worried about their family or their you know, close um, friends knowing about. And depending on the also of the country you came, it could be really dangerous that people know that you are gay, or even though if you are gay friendly, it's also a problematic. So the open call had to do with this specific scene of Nicholas Ray's um, Girl Without Calls, which is a film where uh, the main actor James Dean has a fight with a friend and the, the friend dies in this fight. So um, he comes back home and he is like uh, asking himself, what did I do? How did this happen? Why, why did I, why did this happen like that? And he suddenly thinks that someone called him uh, chicken and the fact that they had called him chicken had made him like need to demonstrate his masculinity and, and you know do something that would really demonstrate a, a man. So this scene is the scene that we showed all the, all the people who came and wanted to collaborate so that in this scene and many different kind of women and backgrounds uh, how do they look for masculinity? How do they play masculinity? What do they think they have to do to play, to be masculine? And so it's, it's like really, somehow the work I think becomes nearly hypnotic. You want to see the next one and the next person and see how they play the same, the same uh, scene. Relating masculinity, the construction of masculinity in different bodies, actually in women's bodies. And cinema for us was quite interesting because we think cinema is in a way a school of behavior. It's like a school of where we can 
look at ourselves and learn how to behave if we want to be a perfect man. We have a lot of examples on cinema. So we did three different works relating to this idea of constructing masculinity in women's body or bodies that are not strictly uh, men's bodies. This is a, a, another work called After Apocalypse Now that we did because we were we had um, offered to do a, a project in the Philippines. So when we knew about this, we thought, what can we do in the Philippines that relates to our work? So we were researching a little bit and we found that Apocalypse Now was shot in the Philippines. Actually, in, uh, there's a scene, especially the scene that is clearly based in Joseph Conrad's uh, book, um, the, the Heart of Darkness in English, I think is the title. And the protagonist is going to the end of a river and somehow approaching the horror. All these scenes were played by a Filipino woman who somehow was also revealing how a place like the Philippines, which is used to film so many different films, but you know, when Coppola talks about Apocalypse Now, he said, this film is not about Vietnam. This is Vietnam. And it was- But it's not. But it's not. It's the Philippines, so it's different. So for I mean, I, I, Philippines is the space of Asia for, for Western people. I mean, the Western minds always, when they think, uh, or they, they think in Asia, they, they show they show in the for instance, the Philippines, which is the main, uh, is the, the main Hollywood uh, scenarios that they, they used to do. Philippines have no identity like we are people because they they speak for for example eighty languages, so they can understand each other except in English, that they, so many people don't speak English, so it's really difficult to build an identity in that condition. And also the Philippines is the name of the king of Spain, Philip, which decided to build a, a country there. So, it's so this contradictory um, ideas about identity, construction of identities, place, and so on, was what interested us to, to do this this appropriation of the scenes of the river uh, in Apocalypse Now with a Filipino woman playing Mark Shin in that part of the film. The question was to destroy, to, in a way, to deconstruct masculinity, and we thought that uh, uh, female bodies deconstruct masculinity in a very high, high level. Uh, the problem of, the, of this kind of uh, works, especially in terms of Photography is that the, the, the better you make, they fail because nobody understands there's a woman there. So people see a man. <laughs> so if we do it well, then we fail. Okay, okay. Well, um, we are left doing this in this uh, um, this way through different works. We don't want to, to stop at this, at this uh, specific work, which is a village of Vespedes' case. Yeah, there's a thing here. This work is different. This work work, work with strangers, the transgender issues, which is not from the, in the, in the first works try to deconstruct masculinity just because we everybody talks about masculinity as something natural after years so we want to demonstrate that it's not natural but doing by video photography doing by photography is, is so easy but if you want to do it by video it's more difficult because then you you see the people move and the way they behave so it's really more difficult than, than in, in a picture then later decided to, to start film. I mean, we were um, a contemporary art center from, from Spain, uh, asked us to make a project there. So we decided to work not with, I mean, what happened with queer, queer people 
in so many countries, I don't know here, but in so many countries, especially Latino countries, we are using uh, Anglo-Saxon references. So it's not our lives. So it's the life of the others that we imported. And, and you don't feel like looking you over in the mirror. You feel like you're a little bit strange. It's something that supposedly is new, um, supposedly are new issues and things that happen outside that are important to your country. So we decided to talk, uh, this, that was in Sevilla, in the south of Spain. So we decided to look for an example based on Spanish experiences. And after doing our research, we find this uh, strange, uh, um, marvelous character. It's not a character, it was a, a real a course called Elena de Céspedes or Elena de Céspedes. In Spanish, A means feminine, O means masculine, because we have a very gender oriented languages. So that was what we decided to title A. That Slash, slash um, it's true that you were saying about you know, using theories and references that are not really our references, and sometimes it's really difficult to find your own references and your own context. Um, even the word queer is so strange for us. I mean, what does queer mean for us? It, it, we are talking about it as an insult. We never lived it on our bodies as an insult. So even we sometimes we say it in, in Spain to say I'm queer sounds even cool. We would say, yeah. Oh, I'm queer. Yeah. And it sounds so nice. But it doesn't have the feeling of of um, a person who has lived that insult on, on their yeah. bodies. When we were in the States, for example, for example there are people when the way they they, they heard, they even just heard the queer word, they feel really uncomfortable. But it, that does happen to us because for us it's like something like any other label, like hippie, like queer, hippie, punk, doesn't mean nothing for you. On the other hand, it's a necessary tool. It's something that you are reading about. You can't, but I mean, in the 90s when we read Butler, for us, it was really a point of uh, inflection. It was important. So you say, I mean, I don't have uh, closer influences. It's, it's difficult that at school, at the university, they give me other references, so I have to take what I find. And if it's a reference that comes from outside, I, I work with it and try to do something with it. So. With Caso Céspedes, with Elena Aleno de Céspedes, it was, for us, it was really um, very powerful to find this person who had lived in the 16th century in Spain, who was charged by the Inquisition, and who lived this incredible life. Actually, when we um, came to know about his, her story, we thought this can't be true. We had to go to the National Spanish Archive, Historical Archive, to look for the documents that were kept, the Inquisition documents which were kept there to make sure and to just be amazed by the story. So we're going to put a fragment of the video. Esta película no va a ser un documental. Alex, nuestro personaje, está revisando unos papeles en los que se le asigna su siguiente encargo. Su trabajo consiste en localizar exteriores para situar la acción. La película gira en torno a Césped, un personaje olvidado por la historia, pero que sin embargo, y para intranquilidad de muchos, fue real como lo demuestran las actas de su juicio inquisitorial. El resumen que aparece en la portada de las actas reduce a unas pocas líneas el significado de toda una vida de transgresión. El juicio y la defensa del orden imperante 
configura un relato que rozaría la literatura fantástica, si no fuera gráfico. Nos queda el recuerdo porque algunos actos considerados criminales fueron meticulosamente registrados en los archivos. Como, insistimos, el film no será un documental, Alex tiene mayor libertad para marcar las tomas y puede dejarse llevar por su instinto creativo. Alex no dirige la película, solo fotografía los espacios, pero para obtener buenos resultados, quiere conocer en profundidad la acción que tendrá lugar en ellos. Su referente, Céspedes, nació en torno a 1545. Era esclava, mulata, probablemente hija de su amo, quien le dio el apellido y el nombre de su ama, Elena. Nació en Alama, Granada. La casaron y tuvo un hijo al que posteriormente cedió. Después decidió vivir como un hombre. Fue soldado en la guerra de los moriscos y se trasladó a Castilla. Un personaje arriesgado que terminó convirtiéndose en cirujano y casándose con una mujer. La denunciaron. Oficialmente, Céspedes sería la primera mujer titulada en cirugía de la que se tiene noticia hasta ahora. Para conseguirlo, tuvo que examinarse como hombre. Se dijo hermafrodita. No había otra salida. Quizá lo fuera, dice. ¿Dónde se quedó Céspedes? ¿En qué parte del camino decidió que debería saltar de un lado al otro o en qué parte del camino los demás decidieron que no podía vivir en paz? Alex también camina de un lado al otro y ahora camina con céspedes. Can be, um, maybe we can comment on them. First of all, that we, when we start, we, we say this is not a docu documentary. For us, working with fiction is, is, is a kind of it's a good methodology because fiction, um, we don't really believe in documentary, maybe because we have always felt as the object of documentaries and we don't really feel comfortable about being observed by this documentary view and we think fiction gives you like more space to dream to construct to be able to be poetic if you want to even if you take a part of reality of course but documentary is fictional in the end so why why use it like like that uh, the other question that was important for us here was, as we said before, to, um, to make a, a person who was born in Spain, incredibly born as a slave, mixed race, uh, and who came to study when, when, they, when the Inquisition judged him, uh, they found he had a, an incredible um, library with medicine books, he had learned to speak Latin, he read in Latin, he, uh, his um, expressions, his, uh, everything he said uh, to the juries during the Inquisition um, trial, uh, it's incredible how he um, arguments and he defends himself as a hermaphrodite. We don't know if he was a hermaphrodite or not, and we don't think that is the important point here. Because, I mean, what we know really is that he could not say, and he would have been, he would not be safe 
if he didn't uh, defend himself as, as hermaphrodite, because being hermaphrodite was something that God has had decided for you. You have, were born like that, so in front of the Jewish, the inquisitional Jewish, it was like, um, you know, this is my body is like that, there's nothing I can do. In those years, to, to, I mean, obviously a woman could, could not uh, dress like a man because the laws, I mean, to, I mean, all of you know, you're supposed, but even Rosa Bonnet should ask permission at the end of the 19th century to the, to the, to the uh, authorities in Paris to dress as a man. I mean, uh, we, we live in societies that decided for years and years and years, thousands of years, that we should dress in this way or in this other way. They have, uh, when Cespedes was uh, denounced, the, the, at the beginning, they, he, has a, he was just by the street civil, um, uh, the civil Jewish, civil Jewish. And in this case, death penalty is the end. The problem is that Thespedes married a man before. So the Inquisition came because bigamy. And that gave him the opportunity to talk to the Jews and talk to them and explain them that he already had, he, he has a, a, he was a woman of course, but he has a penis when, when he gave, gave birth a boy he has a, a, a suddenly a penis appeared in his body, and after that he said that nowadays he has no penis because the penis failed because an an, an illness and it's, it's, it's unbelievable the trial. It, it is it was a very very good defense. What is interesting about this is it is because of the Inquisition trials and documents that we know about someone like this. Uh, which is mm, interesting. There's probably many other festivals, but we don't know about them because many, we are convinced that many women passed as men and, and men passed as women, and nobody knew. And sometimes they discovered when they died. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, the documents of the Inquisition that give us uh, an idea of how these lives were. So it, it is difficult, I mean, it is a reference for us because allow us to talk about so many topics in Spain that nobody, not too many people want to talk about that, which is, for example, the, the slavery. So, I mean, we, we never study about the slavery in the schools. So suddenly the, we have a, a, a person who is a slave and um, allow us to research the slavery, the, in, not in the south of Spain, but in all the, the peninsula because in Portugal it's also the same province, so allow us to talk about gender, about racial issues, about so many things, and put the people, the young people, in contact with this past that uh, makes you feel, uh, in those years in, the, in, in Spain was a lot of identities that are being hid, but the hidden by the scientists and his art, not only our historians, but historians and people like that. How is it possible that we, as queer people, don't know anything about Thespedes, which is a reference in our own culture. Why there are not so many people trying to make a research in those cases that you have near you and allow you to understand so many things about your society? And your context and your history. So, so um, this is... Very briefly, another project that we did in Matadero. Matadero is a slaughterhouse that was converted into an art center in Madrid. And uh, this place, uh, the, the, in this place, the art um, gallery is the old um, part of the slaughterhouse where the, it's the fridge, like the fridge where meat was hung. So when we were invited to, to do a project in this space, we thought what? And one of the, the, method, the methodology that we use is to work in the, in the spaces that ask us to make a research. So 
we uh, we normally we make a kind of fiction or something that happened and we film in that spaces. So for example, the Cespedes case was filmed in the contemporary art center in Sevilla, and this is filmed in the slaughter house or the Venice Pavilion. We use the Venice the, 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 the space of the Pavilion to make a project. Or casting Jameson was filmed in the art in an art gallery. It's like the, the place where you are going to see the film, the f at least the first place where you're going to see the film is the same place where the action uh, that you are seeing was developed. And in this case, uh, when we were there and when we were invited to do this project, we thought, what this space, what, what is this space? What fiction would happen here? What is this space talking about? We thought being, uh, in jail was uh, the sensation that first came to our mind. So we invited uh, four women who were in prison at that time to collaborate with us for this. We go, we go to the jail and talk to them and explain to them that they are appear in a, of course, a lesbian queer artwork. So it costs a little bit to, to have people who want to work with that. So, Let's see. What we decided was to do a musical. Is that it? In the group, we have four personages. They just come up and tell you what they want to do. The movie will be an exit in the way that you will be able to see the audience and you will be able to see what you are saying in the fiction. Para conseguirlo, hay que preparar cuidadosamente la escenificación. Y como lo vais a hacer este año, cuanto más artificial sea, más real os parecerá. Tía, ¿dónde estamos? En una cárcel, parece. Sí, yo creo que es una película. ¿Y qué vamos a hacer aquí? Esperar a Godot para variar. Yo pienso que en realidad no hay idea para qué estamos aquí. Bueno, a mí me han dicho que es para que podamos hacer lo que queramos. Sí, ya. ¿Qué haría yo si fuera rico? Dice. O si sea, algún día me tocara un pico, pues me compraría un inmenso yate y vaciaría todos los escaparates. Si yo fuera rico, pues haría todo aquello que tanto critico. Contratar contables, invertir en bolsa, comprar un descapotables, que le den al cosa. ¿Crees que eso es lo que haría? Eso no es verdad. Porque ni con todo el oro del mundo, amigo, puedes comprar tu libertad. Puedes pagar un veredicto, sí, pero no tu conciencia. Porque el dinero solo habla un idioma, el de las apariencias. Lo que yo haría es solo mío, es un secreto. What we asked these women who wanted to collaborate was to build a kind of musical in the slaughterhouse. So they said that we don't know how to sing, we don't know how to, we are not musicians. And we also we don't know what to say. And so we, we said, let's work together. And we, with the idea we often told them that we could work about was based in a, a film that I'm not sure how it is. It's Little on the Roof. It's like, if I were a rich man, this, this song that is quite well known, we, we asked all of them, do you think you would be in prison if you were a rich man? So thinking about this idea, uh, they came about what they wanted to say, what we could work about, and what we could together with them uh, maybe uh, talk about in the film. So in the end, um, one of them uh, also, they danced and they, 
si yo fuera rico. Si yo fuera un ricacho, no daría golpe. Dube, 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 por igual y así no tendría que pelear no habría rey ni princesa tampoco vamos a rompir a cantar solo ya respeto y dignidad si yo fuera rico, tu vida, 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 That's happening in the process. You are talking to the people and they ask at the end, they feel like comfortable in the stage and feel like, yes, I can, I try it. So that's part of the artwork that people don't, don't really see, but it's for artists, it's the most rich part of, the, of this kind of projects to talk, to work with them and negotiating the words. There are something that they don't want to make the script, but, but we, we talk to them and they say, oh, I want to say, for example, I want to talk about respect because nobody respects women in jail. The way that people is, is uh, the, the way that authorities uh, treat, women in, uh, treat, treat women in jail is to uh, make them feel like girls, like little girls. It's like, it's, it's really weird, man. I mean, you feel like violence, the violence of the system not allowing you to be an adult. For example, with, with uh, transgender people, what they, they used to, to do is always talk to you in the feminine name, always in public spaces, for example, things like that. It's different like in, in men's chairs, different treatment. In this project, uh, so we asked um, the four women who accepted to collaborate if they wanted to appear or if they wanted to cover their faces or whatever. And they said, no, no, we want to appear like that. We said, do you want to put your names? And they said, yes, we want to put our names. But we were talking about how important for us is to have a methodology that really has this in mind. I mean, we have different uh, art, political artists who don't work like that. And for us, this part of, of the process is quite important. This is the space, how the space was uh, designed. Uh, we, we decided to put this, uh, the scenery to the front part when you came inside the, the art center. And to see the film, you have to go to the back. It was the backstage. You have to go to the backstage to know what's going on, what's been going on in, in that space. Yes. Yeah. The sentence that you, it was written there is Pregunta Yalba. Habla is like ask and tell, which is the opposite of don't ask. Don't tell that the US in the in the US Army for not to talk about. I mean you can be homosexual, but if you don't want to talk about that. Uh, and now is uh, the actual Trump president decided to put also transgender people out of the army again. So the, the sentence is uh, nowadays 
more important than just the news. <laughs> but for us, what was important was ask and tell. This is a... Uh, we are in the class in terms of transgender rights in the, in the world. I mean, also in Latin America. There's and also in Spain. And also in Spain. Transgender rights, yes. This is it. So this is a very important portrait of very fast. But this is an archive of models, which is a photographic project that we did with different women who questioned um, gender and masculinity in their own bodies. And it's also a collaboration. We, we told them what film, what actor, or what uh, character would you like to impersonate if you could impersonate it for a picture. So each one of them chose um, a character or an actor. It's a European project, so we, we travel for different countries asking for people to, to do that. It, it's, I mean, when we ask the people, uh, some persons stay two months just thinking about the, the character they want to play or things like that. It's not a, a quick decision. It's not the person like the character. It's take care about what kind of character you, do you want to impress me, which is in a way, there are people who felt uncomfortable with all the possibilities. There's also, um, we, we, did, we, take, we took pictures of the places where they, the countries, where they, the cities, where they live, looking for spaces that would look like, that would be the scenarios for the film they had chosen. And it's also, again, going back to fiction and how fiction really is all over its uh, context is fictional in a way. And also, uh, we did this, um, these files, where every one of them explained why they had chosen this character or this actor. And uh, some of them, like Cole, for example, Josie Riddick explained that uh, even though she didn't like the films, but she liked the, the actor, Vin Diesel, who had uh, created his own production, film and production company, to have a company that would have a main character that was mixed race. Yeah, because as a, as a mestizo man, uh, nobody wants to give him some characters on the films. So if he wanted to play a, a specific character of hero or a main character with, with some positive um, value, value, values, uh, they, 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 they need to build her own uh, property, I mean, it's production company. So you need to, it's, it, it was, we usually say to the people, if you don't have a contest, you need to create a contest. So when we started, for example, as we don't have, a, we didn't have a contest, we decided to create a contest in theoretical ways with so many issues. So for Paul, it really was important because that. Martina chose in Portugal Ray Sebastião, who's also an important figure, historical figure there. And that was the only person who decided not to choose a character from Hollywood. I mean, we, we didn't say that people choose a Hollywood character, but everybody looks this, watch this cinema, and the references in terms of like identity issues are in those kind of scene, uh, Hollywood uh, or mainstream points of view about identity, which means at the end that everybody is copying the same. Because if you realize everybody is James Dean at the end, <laughs> so many actors are James Dean. Limited, they imitate once and again and again. And going back to theory and how important theory has been for us, we and how we think of theory as something you can dance, you can approach in a way that is more creative than only just reading it or understanding your reading and your uh, approach to the theory itself, to the words, to the language as a dance. We did this dance in gender travel project, which is based on a workshop with people. And we uh, 
to the partners gender travel together. We, we did it in, in Chile first, then Mexico, Madrid, and different places where they had not seen people who had danced the text before in other countries. And uh, we invited them to dance the text the way they felt the text could be. Sometimes we don't know what people want to do in this. Sometimes we want people to be free. And negotiate the space. And negotiate the, the, the parts of the text they, they want to talk to, they want to dance. In, for example, there are some parts of the group that uh, people want to dance in Santiago de Chile, but they don't want to dance this in Mexico. Um, there, were, there were big arguments between the people in terms of contents of the text. de los binarios de, de género, por ejemplo, tan monstruosa o tan temible que por definición se afirme que es imposible y heurísticamente queda descartada de cualquier intento por pensar el género. se presenta como una invitación. Este desplazamiento permanente conforma una fluidez de identidades que propone abrirse a la resignificación y a la recontextualización. La multiplicación paródica impide a la cultura hegemónica y a su crítica confirmar la existencia de identidades de género esencialistas o naturalizadas. This was in Mexico City, so in 2014. And after that, we, we decided that for us, this is the way we presented the, the work in the art space with a platform where people have danced and the different monitors where you could see what they have been dancing. Another project related to this uh, that was based on violence was rapping philosophy that we did um, with text from, uh, well it was like a travel from biopolitics to necropolitics and based on different studies about violence, precariousness, images in times of war, and it goes from Foucault to Achille Mende. Foucault, um, Butler, Santa, and Mende, these four texts. So text, we studied them with four MCs, with three MCs, who um, read them with us and then learned a, um, these fragments of the, of the texts. Actually, it was interesting to talk to them and see how they would say, well, this is this text, I, I have never read Foucault, I have never read Sontag or Butler, but they say things that have to do a lot with what I rap, I do with when I rap. We put just a brief fragment. Um, just in this set to realize how it sounds. No vamos a parecer, sino que se retoma la célula mismo de Estado, fenómeno fundamental del 19, pues, considerando las vidas constantes del poder y los destinos de algún modo, destinos de ejercicio del poder sobre el hombre, en cuanto a ser vivente, en la especie de estatización de lo que el hombre, en la estatización de lo que el hombre. Si no 
nadie ni siquiera los pacifistas o los tiranos a impedir el genocidio en vano a presentar ante la justicia los que violan gravemente a las leyes de la guerra. La guerra tiene leyes y al atenerse a ellas se hacen capaces de impedir guerras específicas y poniendo alternativas negociadas al conflicto armado. Al conflicto armado, fotografías de las víctimas de guerra son exitísimas, una suerte de retórica reitera, así tan significativa Judith Butler, un congreso reciente, escucha al director de una editorial contar una historia que no estaba clara, no se identificaba con el punto de vista, no se lamentaba tener que dar malas noticias. La historia que contó era en otro congreso asistido, en el que el presidente de una universidad dijo que ya nadie leía libros de humanidades. En esta época ya no tenía exilio, no estoy segura si estaba diciendo que el presidente afirmaba que el presidente perdieron su autoridad moral, pero parecía eso. Opinión a tomar en serio. Don't want uh, the authorities don't want uh, to go to the opening 
because they say, oh, you can do a video because that, that's a work, but a, 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 an opening is a party. And we try to convince the authorities that that's, I mean, there's no opening at all if they are going to stay there because the party is an essential part of the, uh, of the art uh, process. The way you show it to the people, the moment you show that to the people, it's really important to me. This is also why we also think that uh, drag is a political um, issue. Yeah. Um, it has to do, and I think nowadays we can see more clearly that it's, um, it is very, it's, it has political, a lot of political implications. Gender, um, questioning gender has a lot of political implications and it worries politicians a lot definitely behave the way we should and we dress the way we should and we act in the way we should be sure. There's now a conservative political party in Spain, it's a new one, Trinity has to fascism and the first thing that they want to do is uh, to refuse women's rights and also not to allow, not to pay uh, the operation for transsexual people. So that's the main points that they have in their agenda. So uh, this is uh, what we, we work with this kind of issues because uh, we thought that obviously feminism and queer uh, world are trying to do a peaceful revolution that is the most important revolution in the world because you can't change your society if you don't have input, if you don't question your, uh, is, is, um, I think it's a pretty stupid separation between feminine and masculine. This is a very easy division for some, uh, the complexity of human beings. And we ask ourselves why, why uh, all the projects, the utopian projects are still, uh, have this separation in their minds. It doesn't matter what they talk. You talk about social class, or you talk about slavery, or whatever, but it's still being the men and the woman, that's something wrong with them. We can't change the world if we don't pass this, this, this frontier, this border, sorry. So in Valencia, so many people come from different groups with different approach to identities in a very complex way. Because now the, this identity is not like it's not. This is not the 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 queer world is not the gay and lesbian world from the eighties. The queer world is really really imagination to the power. 